All right, here we go. Overdrive off and running. TSN 1050 on the TSN app. Your home smart speaker and up on TSN 2 all after day, all afternoon, all after day. Good start. I need you <laughs> hosting, Frankie. You're a host now. You take over. Yeah, You're smoother dude. than I am. Come you on don't, now. You don't need that, but I'll tell you what. I was thinking about you and Al's brother last night after the pick wow. came in and, you know, there's a little back and forth. I was worried about you guys. You know what I was worried about? I was worried about you guys turning into the inverse Jim Cramer Twitter account. You know what that is? <laughs> yes. You know that 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 financial guy is on MSNBC and he says every stock that's going to be good, it goes terribly wrong and all the people go against him and they make money. They have portfolios where they make money doing the opposite of what this guy says and I think you guys were one loss away from turning into the inverse Hayes and Bro. So I'm happy that didn't happen. Last I think time. you're right and I, I I don't I know who Jim Cramer is. I, I know he's a he's a great entertainer. The thing is he's talking about money. You know, that's right. the amazing thing. The guy's flying off the handle, he's talking a million seconds a minute, and the guy, you know, he's a piece of work, yet I have noticed that he does seem to be a pretty significant cooler when it comes to making calls. And I, I would love to to see like a fly on the wall for the CEO of that company when he says I'm bullish on this. Oh, you no. got to oh, have this. You know the CEO immediately is like, I'm going to faint. I, I, yeah. I got to resign. I got to get out of here because <laughs> this guy's pumping our tires and I'm screwed. Wow. Yeah, there was, there was going to be an inverse Hayes and Bro Twitter And it didn't happen because we picked a winner. And Noodles, right. you were here. You saw it. Al's brother deserves all the credit in the world because the ayahuasca retreat, again, was a huge success. And he nailed that analysis he, last he, night. He did. But let me ask you guys this. In watching that game, New England looks like a like an expansion team. Like Offensively, they, they're know. terrible. They just have they they just it, don't have enough. There's nothing there. There's no. Nothing. Now they're talking about switching out quarterbacks, like you know, all sorts of nonsense. Now the Jets look good. Aaron Rodgers look good. But it, is it is it did they play really well, or is it just that the Patriots are just they stink, or is it a combination? of I both? think a combination of both. I, I think. Listen, New England, to their credit, they're they're one and two now, and it, yeah. it's going to fade. They're not a playoff team. Everyone knows that, but they deserve a lot of respect for the way they played the first couple of weeks, where they battled, and I thought yeah. they battled last night. They just ran into a tough opponent on the road, short week. The Jets are better. Aaron Rodgers like <laughs> was slinging it last night and feeling great and looked great, and we'll touch on that throughout the afternoon. But I think it's the right play because Mayo came out already and said, we're going back to Jacoby Brissett. They have to protect Drake May. Like th this is, it's kind of like the tide is turning a little bit in the NFL where over the last 10 to 15 years, probably based on cap issues, the amount of money these players get, owners get involved, the marketing departments get involved. If you have a top five pick, even a top 10, maybe a first round pick, it's expected that guy shows up and he plays and he yeah. immediately has an impact. And I think New England is doing the right thing here because they know their offensive line isn't very good. They don't have a lot of weapons. They're outside of Stevenson in the backfield, who's a very good back. He's not an all-world. He's not Marshall Falk or Ladanian Tomlinson or something. He's just a really good back. And he's going to have tough nights when the defense does what it did last night. So I would not throw Drake May in, into that scenario. I, I would keep him out. Let him practice. Let him hold the clipboard. He's going to go into a few games here or there like he did last night. And uh, Jacoby Brissett's a good pro who's been around who is he going to win you a ton of games, but he'll he'll be respectable, right? He'll show up. He'll be, he'll be a pro, and that's kind of what they expect out of him. He was running for his life last yes, night. Yes, he got like hit it, hard last night. I, I, I don't know. Is the stat that he's been sacked nine times? Is it like is that a correct stat? Like he's been he's been hit hit hard. It felt like, like it was a lot last night and that Drake May should only go in under circumstances like last night where the game's a little bit of a it's a runaway game. You give him some reps here or there. He should not be starting games for that team. And I think the, there's there's a lot of significance in that game for the Jets where you're supposed to beat the Patriots, and you're supposed to beat them by a lot. And I think everyone today, or even last night, is talking about the Rodgers and Salah, like the, the interaction, and Rodgers is saying, like, it's too early, get away from me. It's like, that's what Rodgers went to the Jets to kind of instill. 
Like, this is a guy who's been an MVP. He's won. Like, he's one of the best quarterbacks of all time. And the Jets, they get excited when they beat a bottom feeder team. Like, that's their Super Bowl. (laughs) And he has to instill in them, like, that's just what we do. This is business as usual. And I thought Aaron Rodgers, like, that was... That was pretty indicative of what he did last night and what his body language was like. Now, he clarified it today. Didn't he say that you pushed him away because he wasn't sure if it was a hug? And he goes, he said something like two-score game. Is that what he – I thought yes, I that, saw that was the comments, ex- right? That was the explanation afterwards because it it didn't look good. It really – it made it, it, Salah look it, like it, kind of a <laughs> – almost a water boy, you know? Like yeah. everything you just said, Frankie, I, I agree with you, you and it's accurate that Rodgers – has been saying that really all off season. Like this team's got to start being more professional. They have to find out how to win. They have to instill a culture and got to right. get out of their own way. And when he was saying that, I thought he applied that to the 52 other players on the roster, but he may have been applying it to the head coach. <laughs> and that is something you just don't see very often where yeah. a player is going to the coach and basically saying, you need to act like you've been here before and that's kind of how I read it. And that's what he did say after the game, like not much of a hugger. Sometimes Sala goes in for the two-hand push, so there was some confusion there. And <laughs> Sala's always pointing. He did give him a push, though. Like, it, did it you was see a little Sala bit of a after the off. first touchdown, though? Like, did you see where he was? He was so far inside the field after that first touchdown. I'm not sure if you guys caught that. Like, it was a bit much for the first touchdown of the game. Sala is really hyped up. And listen, his job's on the line. Like, he, he needs to win this year. He absolutely has to. And he also understands where his bread is buttered, and it's Aaron Rodgers. Like, yeah. Rodgers has got to drag him to the promised land, and watching him sling that ball around last night is, I will admit, I, I missed it. And, and as a Packer fan, I, I understand how lucky I was for a long, long time. He He's took it un- for granted. Yeah. When that guy is reading defenses and feeling it and on his toes and he's in the mood – it he's is so smooth. It yeah, is so smooth. Like the spiral is perfect. He's off. He's off his back feet. Sometimes he's in the air throwing the ball, and, and you just you look at him and you, like he can throw a little five yard check down and make it look stunning. You know, make it look yeah. like it's a piece of art. Uh, I really, I don't think you can embellish enough when speaking of just how smooth and graceful he is in the pocket and how good he is when he throws the ball. And I think even above and beyond all of that last night, him looking good, him being comfortable, him winning the game, the Jets winning the game, the Jets are 2-1. and one. He actually cut, took a couple of hits last night, and one in particular where he was running out of bounds and he was getting chased down by a monster. <laughs> and I can't remember the name of the guy, but he tackled them from behind by the legs. And that, I think, was a big moment for Rodgers. And the Jets, because he got up, was all good, told his teammates to back off, let's get back in the huddle and keep playing. Because he had, I think he had to go through that, right? When you suffer the injury that he suffered, it's always making you breathe a little bit uneasy. Like, when is it going to happen again? Or is he 100%? And I think him taking that hit when he was getting chased out of bounds was a really significant moment last night. It it is interesting. Like, how do you you interpret what the resistance is for Aaron Rodgers? Because there's that hit – there's also a few times where he gets out of the pocket and he starts running and the guy's 40. Like he's he's yeah. old. He, he looks old when he's running and I'm thinking like that's a good sign that he can actually he's got a little bounce in his step and he doesn't I don't know, he doesn't look like doesn't look like the Achilles would be hurting him or bothering him he because I good, thought he man. did a pretty good job getting out of the pocket. I was I was actually pretty impressed. Yep. I I saw that hit and I thought, you know, isn't it a, a way where it's your first marker? You know, you see guys that are coming back off injuries. It's like, okay, you take a hit, give a hit, you know, all of these types of things. That was like his first real, real test where you got hit and, and there was some emotion involved, and, and he was fine. You know, I thought he was dialed in. He's become – Hayes, you can weigh in on this because you've watched him probably more intently than anybody. Has he embraced kind of like the – I don't want to say the heel role, but he's got this smug look. He was smiling on the on the sidelines. Like, he's got this arrogance about him. And we all know he's amazing. But you see the people love him or people now that love to hate him. Like, there's no in-between on Aaron Rodgers, where I felt before everyone just respected him as, like, an amazing quarterback. I think he's embraced, you know, kind of like the – 
a big personality, we'd call it. Like, yeah, he's he's definitely been much more outspoken on non-football topics over right. the last couple of years, which has dragged a lot of people in to his world that maybe weren't there before or didn't really know anything about him personally or what he was all about. Right. So I, I guess there, there might be a component to that. I also think when you're in Green Bay, when you're a Packer, the team, it's such a small town. It's publicly owned. Like there's something about the aura of the Packers. It's like people don't really hate them. You know, like it, obviously Bears fans would. Pe- teams within the division naturally. But it's it's not like the Cowboys and maybe other big public teams. And now he's in New York. You know, now he's a Jet. Now he's coming off what happened last year. And he understands the importance of, of kind of dragging that team into the dance. And with any great player, and it's very, very evident with a guy like Rodgers, who knows he's great, there is a thin line between ego and arrogance, yeah. right? And I think he crosses over basically <laughs> every snap. You know, yeah. like you never know what you're going to get. But there are a lot of people that believe in Aaron Rodgers, a yep. lot of people. Nobody believes in Aaron Rodgers more than Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. And that that is something that I think all players have to have. I guarantee you Shohei Otani, like he smiles and laughs oh, and he doesn't smokes. talk much. I guarantee you he's, he's, he's standing there, you know, before the game, staring at the mirror saying, I'm the best player in the world and no one can touch me. Might and be the wait best player of all time at tonight. some point, Hayes. Isn't like this guy ridiculous? might go down as the best player of all time. And to be honest with you, even him just being a hitter, he's he's worth all every penny. Every penny is a hitter, even without pitching right now. It's incredible what this guy's been doing that's, and what he that's did. That's what's staggering is that this guy was a John Morosi tweet away from doing that for the Jays last night in Texas. <laughs> Stop John, it. John Morosi. I mean, everyone's like, he's on the plane. He's on his way up. Yeah. This guy's going to be a Blue Jay. And as bad as the Jays' season was going to be, even with Otani, they still were likely going to miss the playoffs. Uh, the idea of being able to watch Otani – do what he's doing is is just astonishing and when you consider this guy's co- this guy's season started with his best friend stealing <laughs> money from him and FBI <laughs> agents showing up at spring training <laughs> like that's how this guy's year started <laughs> sitting true. in a room with FBI agents <laughs> And now he's hit 50 home runs and stolen 50 bases. The way you lay that out, like, we forget about that. seems like that was three years ago. Yeah. That was the start of the season. Like, that was the start of his career for the Dodgers. That's right. He's getting deposed by the FBI, and his best buddy is in the clink. Like, yeah. that's literally what's happening. That's all I could think about last night is he's getting interviewed, and there's an interpreter there. I'm like, I wonder if that guy's doing some gambling I know, for him. Man. Like- Did he have him going six for six last night? I wonder what that paid for Otani last night. Like, does the new interpreter just go like, man, I knew he'd get 50 and 50. I hammered that problem. Talk about perspective. Like, if he would have had a down season this year – you could have just said it started like that and it ended like that. It was just one of these seasons that, you know, he's not pitching and, and maybe he doesn't settle in and doesn't get a bunch of bombs and stolen bases. Instead, he's gone the other way where I don't think you could ever say $700 million is a bargain, but he's worth every penny. Like, that's the, the, I, the crazy I would think part. so. If you're the Dodgers, I mean, when you consider the numbers he's put up, and like last night is a microcosm of what this guy's been doing for years. He goes six for six, three home runs, two doubles, a single, 10 RBI, four runs scored, two stolen bases. <laughs> he had 17 total bases last night. And on top of that, he, he obviously established, you know, the, the 50 and 50, not something we've never seen in Major League history, 50 home runs, 50 stolen bases. And he won up there because now he's 51 and 51. And he's still got a number of games where I wouldn't be shocked if he gets to 55 and 55. And it's just – it's an astonishing season when you consider he's not even pitching and he would likely still be doing this or real close to it if he was pitching. You think he would? Yeah. You think, like, he's doing this if he's pitching? I mean, listen, he may not be playing as much. Like, he'd have more days off yeah. probably. So I guess I have to rescind that comment. I'm not sure he 40 gets and to 40. the same. 40 like, and 40, 40, I think 40 he hits. for sure. I think yeah. he hits 40 and yeah. 40 for sure yeah. if he's pitching. I, I do. I mean, he – because he, he, he had found a way to kind of master both and not allow one to kind of sink the other or get in the way of the other. He just – and the, the amazing thing is that's probably how he follows up the season. He's going to win the NL MVP. He's, he's, his numbers are staggering. He's establishing records we've never seen before. And he'll show up to camp next year and probably start pitching again. 
But how about this, Hayes? He gets to he gets to play some playoff baseball. Like yes. this guy has been with the Angels for his entire career. We get to see this guy play in October, which is going to be yeah. awesome. It's good for the game. It's good for fans. And you know, to follow up what he did in the regular season and get this guy into the playoffs, it makes the game so much more compelling for everyone involved. Like it's a, it's about time we had the best player playing some playoff ball. Yes, it's unbelievable. This is good for baseball. It's good for viewership. Plus, I'm curious to see like. They were saying, now, is this true or not? There's a chance that he might pitch in the yes, play, might be they're, available. They're, they're hoping that maybe he gets to a point where he can give them some innings. Obviously, out of the bullpen, it's not he's not going to start games. Yeah. But if I that, wouldn't do it. it. Uh, and that's the question. Like, do If you do it, is it do you do it like only if you get to the World Series? You know, are you going to do it in the divisional round? Are you going to do it in the ALC, or NLCS? I don't know. But um, depends how hard up you are for pitching. Like, why, I don't know, this guy's finally got to the dance. He's having an incredible year at the plate. Like, why Why risk all of that just to have him pitch an inning or two? Don't well, you think, like, you you must have guys that can help you get out of a jam if you really need but to. But you know playoff baseball, man. These games are wild. Like, you get starters getting pulled in the second, third inning that look great. Yeah. And it, they're just, it's a long chess game. And, yes, the Dodgers likely will have guys that they have to feel good about and if he's not an option he's not an option but man it's compelling wouldn't it be like if if you're sitting there and you're in a position where you need three outs you need three outs in the seventh inning eighth inning or whatever and Otani comes to you and goes I got it man my arm's alive I'm fine how that's crazy who's gonna be better than him well, exactly I, who who could possibly put up but, a, a better run than than Shohei Otani on the mound my question is is for pitchers Obviously, they he, they would have to be ramping it up. Obviously, he throws balls every day from the field, all of that. But it's a lot different animal than throwing ninety five yes, to hundred and and getting set and stuff. So, would he be, you know, behind the scenes working out and pitching and and testing it? Hey, I'm going to throw twenty five pitches today. Like he'd have to be trying to ramp up that training from behind. And God forbid he hurts something. That's the thing that I would be concerned about. You want his bat. You want his base stealing. Mm -hmm. If if he if he's working on coming back as a pitcher and tweak something, you might lose the whole shebang. Well, and that obviously would would be a concern. I mean, it's Dave Roberts isn't going to do anything until he's told from the doctors and management and ownership and Otani, this is what's available. You know, like they're they're not going to do anything off a of whim or anything like that or out of desperation. That that's not going to happen. But, and it's such a massive investment. You have to protect it. You have to protect him. You have to make yes. sure that he's in the right position. So I'm not holding my breath that he will pitch. I, I would I would guess he probably won't. But the idea that that's kind of hanging over the team and the, the sport, I think, is actually a really positive story. Like, well, the fact it's a possibility. That, that's it. That's all you need. Just It's like, give me a little piece of thread, and I'll keep pulling on it. Like Give me the yeah. idea that this guy could pitch. And hit in like a World Series, it just it would be incredible to watch. It would be the yeah. ultimate unicorn thing for this guy, you know. Like he keeps doing things that that we don't really see, and for him to come back off the surgery and pitch like in the playoffs in a jam, the guy hasn't pitched in a long time. I don't worry about his capability. I really don't. Like I I agree with Noodles. I think it's like what if it's a shoulder tweak or an elbow tweak or a pack or something. That's what would worry me. Yeah. I would have no issue with him going out there and striking out the side or two strike outs getting someone to fly out that's not my concern it's protecting the asset more than anything sure yeah. but it was it was pretty incredible like we were on the air yesterday and he had already hit a home run and i think we said or o said oh oh called o, it o said he's like oh he'll how what 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 where's the game at and i was like sixth inning or whatever he goes he'll he'll do it today yeah. and within 10 minutes of us being off the air he had hit his 50th home run opposite field too, which is just another incredible st <laughs> like insane. testament to him. Just he just wow. waves at it and pushes it to left field. How, <laughs> how about his fifty first though? He almost hit it out of the building. Yes, yeah. now that they had that. the they had the trainer pitching by the end. <laughs> well, and, and you know what? I got to give credit to to the manager in Florida because he was asked uh, about the idea of walking Otani. He's like, "We're not doing that." Florida, they're terrible. Like it's been yeah. an awful season. It's a lot like the Jays and Schneider and, and walking around Judge. You know, last month which was embarrassing. Like, your, right. your team's done. Put the ball in someone's hand 
and say, go up there and challenge the best player in the world. He got you? Okay, tip your cap. But don't dance around it. Don't walk around it. I actually love the fact that um, the Marlins manager admitted to that and was asked about it, which is reasonable. And if it was a more important game, if Florida was in a hunt, they would have walked him. They clearly would have pitched around him. It would have been crazy right. to continue to pitch him, considering how well he's been playing and how locked in he was last night. But go at him. Go at him. Yeah. And, and he beat you. He beat you six times. But – you know, that 50th home run, it was a brawl out in left field to get the ball. Oh. And my understanding is someone was reporting. He walked out. He yeah, but I got to find right? out who was there, – there was a report that an 18-year-old kid originally – or claims that he caught it and someone ripped the ball out of his hands and took off. Yeah. that That is the report. I think Darren Rovell was reporting that today, that the ball was ripped out of the hands of an 18-year-old – High school senior on his birthday, like really laying oh it on God. thick. Oh. Which, well, how yeah. are you supposed to really know? I mean, unless you, someone breaks down the tape. But it's it's a tough call because you know ball goes into the outfield or whatever. Generally speaking, it's it's whoever it's like a fumble. You know, whoever can get it, you get it. And once you've got it, you secure it and you get the hell out of there. And yeah. that's what happened last night. I don't. I you know that guy's not handing that ball back in. Just like Judge when he hit sixty two in Texas. That guy wasn't going to hand that ball back in. I wouldn't. No, you're I'm not giving it up building. for a, a Buddy, signed it's a, hat. It's, a, it's a free market, man. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like, you got the goods. No problem. You guys got a lot of money. If you want it, you probably know where to reach me. Right. That's the yeah. way it works. Shohei can have it for a million. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, that's ultimately what it would be. You want it? A million dollars. No well, problem. You, what you do is you take it home. You make sure you can get home and not mugged or attacked mm -hmm. by anybody. And you call a lawyer and, and you... you Put it in a safe or whatever, and you get it all sorted out. Yeah, and you cash it in all they're, day. They're going to pay big bucks for that. And that that manager, Skip Shoemaker, that's yes. his name. That guy's Skip. jacked. Love Skip. That guy look. He was scary, man. Like he's just <laughs> jacked sitting there. It's like we're not doing that. I I thought it was awesome. I don't know. I think we have the sound of him, but I I thought it was awesome. Yeah, good for him. Like that listen, he, the team stinks, and and you got smoked last night. No, Tani got you. But don't don't run from the challenge. Go back at him. He got you. Go back at him. He got you. So be it. You know, yeah. season's over. Challenge your group. Um, all right, Bobby Carpenter coming up, former NFLer on the game last night. Start teeing up the rest of week three in the NFL. Luke Wilson will be on. I cannot wait to hear from Luke because he, he got absolutely KO'd by Al's brother yesterday. And that's just a straight <laughs> fact. That is an objective opinion that Al's brother put him in a blender with his analysis yesterday. And Luke is going to have to respond to that because Al's brother is riding high, as he should. Hazenbro riding high, as we should, after a big win. An immaculate week, we believe, is in the air. More picks later this afternoon. Mike Johnson coming up as well. Frankie Corrado's in here. Jamie Noodles, McLennan on Brian Hayes. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 2. Overdrive continues, brought to you by FanDuel, bringing you everything from the opening line to the final score. More picks on week three later this afternoon. Mike Johnson coming up. Day two of uh, Leafs camp on the ice. I guess day three of camp, day two on the ice. And before you know it, they're playing games, right? Yeah. Go Let's time. Get after it. I. That's the best part is you get into the games. Like camp, I feel – now camp is so short right now. Like guys – I, I don't mind a few days of practice, but now you're chomping at the bit to get into some games, get some timing going, all of that type of stuff. And as a player, too, I always hated it. I don't know how you were, Frankie, is when there were 65 guys at camp. There's just, oh, you know, yeah. three teams and, like, too many floaters around and stuff. You want to get down to the team or close to the team as quick as possible. Yeah, when we got down to, I don't know, five lines of forwards and maybe four lines of defense, I thought that was like a nice little way of easing things in because practice was still like manageable, um, but, you know, you still had some extra bodies laying around. Yeah. But we'll get there. We'll get there. And right now, like, you know, you see the way practice went yesterday. The message is pretty clear, man. It's got to be gritty and competitive, and it's all about battles, and it's a little different than what we've seen out of camp in recent years in Toronto. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, there are battles, uh, like you said, the last couple of days. Um, Jake McCabe was speaking today, and he said he loves it here, wants to sign an extension. Uh, effectively said negotiations are underway. That would suggest it probably will happen. And I found that – I always find it interesting when guys come out and say that, like Tavares, McCabe. I'm not surprised at all. But there is this – there's a portion of the fan base that has this ridiculous, inaccurate belief 
whenever anything goes wrong or there's some media story or some guys getting, you know, taken to the woodshed with criticism, you yeah. see it and hear it all the time. This is why people don't want to play here. Couldn't yeah. be further from the truth. Guys constantly want to play here. Constantly want to stay here. Austin signed. Willie signed. McCabe's dying to stay. John Tavares dying to stay. Are there examples of players that would prefer to play elsewhere? Of course. That applies to 32 teams in this league. Everywhere. Every Everywhere. single place. But it's such a cop-out, and it's so inaccurate, this idea that, wow, the media is too hard. That's why guys don't want to stay here or Dude, sign here. the media here. is not too hard it's in Toronto. It's not hard I'm sorry. at all. It, it it's really soft is not compared to other places. Considering the history of this team, Yeah. like, are you kidding me? Do, do you know yeah. what the equivalent would be if the Yankees went – 55 years without winning. No you kidding. Know? I mean, <laughs> no kidding. Just, but there's nothing. It's absurd. Dude, the, there's nothing like being a Maple Leaf. Like, there's nothing like it. It's really cool. Every Saturday night, it's the center of the hockey universe, and everyone talks about it. Like, when I played on the Canucks, we would roll in on Saturday night, and guys would joke around tongue-in-cheek, like, here we are. It's the center of the universe, you know, a little sarcastically. But it it is. Like, it really is, and it, it's really cool, and uh, it's it's awesome to experience. And I think once guys get a taste of it, um, you know, barring th- they, you know, can tolerate it, which mm. it seems like a lot of guys can and enjoy it, there's there's really nothing like it. It's really cool. Yeah, I, I think it comes back down to, Brian, is individual. Like, we're all our own little brand. So if a guy doesn't get ice time, if he doesn't like the coach or whatever – It's part of the package, and that happens in 32 organizations. That doesn't just happen in Toronto. So I I think what comes with Toronto is a shining light, and you either excel in it, and there are guys who don't love that shining light that maybe they fall into the back, you know, back burner a little bit. I I look at a guy like uh, TJ Brody. He was How many times was he interviewed when he was here? He was here five years. Right, no one bothered him. There's a great example. No one said anything to TJ because – and there is a difference – and I get this, and this applies in in the larger markets. When you're a right. superstar compared to a depth player, depth players, right. I would think this is the greatest spot because you, you're a celebrity, you get access to amazing things, yet you're not really asked of much. You know what I mean? In terms of yeah. the way the media is going to handle you, fans are not going to really be on top of you. If you're a third line guy, second pair guy, just go out and do your job, and it's probably incredibly cool to, to yeah. have access to things that you just simply would not get anywhere else if you're in the same position. Um, but, yeah, Brody's, Brody's an example. Played here for, what was it, four years? I think four or five years. Four or and five years, it. And, it was, and it was a prominent guy, top-pairing guy. Just go out and do your job. All good. Everyone else leaves you alone. No yeah. problem. Uh, all right, Mike Johnson in about a half an hour. So week three got off to a bang if you're a Jet fan. They're 2-1 and one now. Didn't start well, right? First week in in San Fran, they got their doors blown off. But they got a win last week. They got a big win last night. Now they're 2-1. Are they back in the driver's seat in the AFC East? To chat about it, we're joined now by a long time uh, college player, NFL player. He's been on the show before. It's always great to have him back. Here's Bobby Carpenter. How you doing, Bobby? I'm doing well. How are you guys doing today? We're doing well. In terms of the AFC East, what kind of statement do you think the Jets made last night? And Do you think they could be the pace car now in that division? Well, I still like Buffalo and Josh Allen and what he's been able to do uh, there. They're in the process of kind of retooling uh, through their next iteration of their playoff run with a quarterback that's still you know, ascending, and they've obviously had to divest some pieces for the salary cap. Look at Miami with Tua and his situation, and what will that be like going forward? I don't think the Patriots, everyone understands, they're in kind of a rebuild. You saw that last night. What you saw out of Aaron Rodgers, I think, was incredibly impressive. That's the guy that you were hoping to get last year. The guy that could come out there, be efficient with the football, throw touchdown passes, get the ball to Garrett Wilson, get the ball out of his hand quick, and still watch him move, taking off-platform throws. He might not be the Aaron of a decade ago, but he's still pretty darn good. He's one of the better quarterbacks in the NFL. So I would say that they might be just a smidge behind Buffalo. They look like a playoff team to me. Uh, let's slide over to sticking with quarterbacks, but slide over to the Patriots. Uh, should Drake may play uh, with the way that the Pats O line is playing, or do they kind of hide him a little bit and and just uh, uh, let Brissett take the the hammering? Yeah, and that's 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 always the the fine line there with rookie quarterbacks. You play them and get experience, even though they know you know the expectation is they're not going to probably have a lot of success early on, and allow that experience to help them grow. 
And, you know, the problem is you need receivers are one thing, but not having guys to block for you in the front. Like, I've watched that destroy David Carr in Houston. You've seen what it's done to Bryce Young. Like, and you have expectations on you to be really good and change the franchise, and you just don't have the pieces around you. It's really tough, and especially the pieces in front of you, because that physical toll just destroys your psyche, and you have a hard time hanging in the pocket. You start getting happy feet. You start looking at the rush, and that's just logical after it's been happening for so long. So I, I, wouldn't, I don't know if I would go all the way in to Drake May yet. You know, they played him, obviously, last night. Um, <sighs> You know, some of it's going to obviously depend on Brissett and everything that's going on with him. But if you can avoid it, I would probably not start playing him until probably midseason at the earliest. When it comes to Rodgers and the Jets and the mentality there as far as, you know, hey, we're supposed to be a good team. We're supposed to beat up on the Patriots. You know, how much work do you think Rodgers has to do there as a guy who's been there and done it and kind of has to instill that as far as, like, let's act like we've been here before and let's have a little more of a, a business-like approach when it comes to games like this? Well, that's, that's part of bringing in veteran players who have had success other places. Not when it's your quarterback helps even more, but, you know, bringing in veteran guys, whether it's offensively or defensively, they can reset the tone. They can reset the culture. They don't have to wear all the mistakes of the past and everything that had happened prior. And see, see, see Aaron, when you go out there with him, I mean, he has a belief he can win every game. I mean, now you're playing the Patriots, who have owned the Jets for the most part over the last two decades. Like, that's, that's tough. Like, a lot of those guys that have been there six, seven years, even three or four, like, it's, you're in the, I wouldn't say it's a defeatist mentality, but it's hard to overcome some of that. Aaron gives them that life and that hope because he doesn't have to understand that he's always won where he's been. And so when you have a guy who has always won wherever they've been, like that, that, that mentality is going to carry over. It's going to spill over. And you can see that confidence really impacting them in a positive way. In terms of just like smooth quarterbacks, um, where would he rank for you in terms of your lifetime? Like just, he makes it look so easy. It's so graceful. Like when he's slinging the ball, is he at the top of your list? Is there anyone else you can think that would be ahead of him? Where would he rank for you? Uh, I mean, I play, you know, playing with Tom Brady, I got a chance to play with, played against Aaron a bunch. Played with Matt Stafford, Tony Romo. Like these guys, they all, they all have some different characteristics. The one thing that Aaron has, and anybody that watches him and you see what he's able to do, his ability to get the ball out quickly, his release is lightning fast. It's just still as quick as anyone's. And I was talking to you know, one of my, my good friends, A.J. Hawk, we played together in, high, in college, and him and Aaron are close. He played with him in Green Bay. And I, watching him throw, like we're texting during the first game against San Fran, like even though they're going to lose this, it, he does a remarkable job of getting the ball out so quickly. It's, it, it, I, it's like few other quarterbacks I've seen. Sticking with quarterbacks, uh, between Derek Carr and Baker Mayfield, which one do you believe can keep their early season form going? Well, I mean, we saw this out of Baker last year. Like, he, he, Here's the thing. Like, I heard you guys talking about situations beforehand. I mean, a lot of times, depending on the guy, you know, it, it transcends sport. It's not every situation, not every organization is the perfect fit for every player. And so I think Baker getting a new life down there in Tampa – he doesn't have to wear the number one overall pick. He doesn't have the, the burdens of Cleveland. And so you see a guy who is he's a great leader when things are going well, and he is a he is a you know, underdog guy. He comes out there. He has a has to have a belief in him. He has he's a fiery personality. He goes out, and I think that that's going to succeed. And then honestly, like, I'm not down like on the Saints. You can look at this as like an anomaly. You know, they brought in. Um, uh, Kubiak's son, as Gary Kubiak's son, is the offensive coordinator, and it really fits their scheme really well. Derek Carr has never been the best quarterback in the NFL, but he gets far too much blame for maybe some of the shortcomings of where he's been. I think he's a very good quarterback still. If you give him protection, you have a run game, and they have some really fast receivers, guys that can get the ball down the field. You watch that. They can run their zone stretch, their play action, push the ball. Like Both of those two uh, – Teams at the beginning of the season, I did not expect to be this good. But I think those are the two teams that are going to be contending in the AFC South. And I think both of them have potential to really be playoff teams as well. With Bobby Carpenter, uh, 0-2 Ravens, 1-1 Cowboys coming off an embarrassment to the Saints last week. Who do you like in that game? 
I like the Ravens. I just I think there's more structure there. I've, they've they've won and won at a high level throughout the regular season. Now they haven't ultimately had you know got the ultimate prize with Lamar, but that team's built with veterans. They're not going to allow them to go zero and three. They're going to find a way to get it right in Dallas. I think they got exposed a little bit against the Saints. Like if you like against Cleveland, they were able to get a lead, you know, and then they could lean on it. Cleveland to get away from the run game, and they didn't run it very well to begin with either. So if you can stay with running the ball on them, which is what Baltimore does, you can beat up that defense. And I would anticipate that Baltimore will be able to do that. They are desperate. They need a win. And I think they get it. Great catching up with you, Bobby. We'll do it again soon. Thank you for this. Hey, my pleasure, guys. Thank you. Bobby Carpenter of uh, the fan down in Columbus and former NFLer and Ohio State Buckeye with A.J. Hawk. That was a good Dude, team. Could you imagine Buckeye the team. Ravens go 0-3? I like, just can't picture that. That's that's the thing about wow. like the NFL and listen, it's a tough spot. Like Cowboys again over the last couple of years have been really good at home. They're coming off an embarrassing loss. They that's they the will thing. be ready they'll, to play. They'll be it's a tough for sure. it's a tough schedule for the Ravens right Very off tough. the hop. Very, really I mean that's why you had to beat Vegas at home. Yeah. You had to. You know, like you, you probably didn't feel great about Kansas City thinking you could be in trouble. They were in the end. It was a tight game. They could have won that game, but they just missed out. But you had to beat the Ravens. They had a double-digit lead in the second half. No, there's no excuse for that. You cannot let that happen because if you're 1-1 one and one and then you blow on to Dallas, it's like, all right, we can still get this together. If you're 0-3, you're in huge, huge trouble. Big time. Big yeah, time. They, they've got to get that game. It, and they're, they're a favorite, a slight favorite. It's basically a pick em, but I think they're like a one-point favorite in isn't Dallas. There, yeah, isn't there a stat, though, a team that goes 0-3? Like, it's... Hard to make the playoffs. Yeah, like, I mean, usually it's the zero and two teams you talk about. Zero and three is even more extreme. So yeah. I, I don't I, know. Like I couldn't tell you the last zero and three team I've ever heard of making the playoffs. I saw ESPN was doing something where there there were some teams that were zero and two, and it's rare. Like the the Bengals had done it recently, and I can't remember there was one other team, but it's not something that happens very often. Let's look wow. that up. Try to find that yeah. out uh, because that that will say a lot about uh, I think how we feel about the Ravens this weekend. Uh, Mike Johnson coming up in about 25 minutes. So big news out of Ottawa. We'll get back into that. Obviously, Noodles, you're close to it. Yeah. There, there. Looks like they've got the land. They're moving the rink. It's um, it's the right play. This is has great. to be. Yeah. It's positive. It has man. to be. It's, but yeah, as so for what's going on in the ice, Josh Norris. You know, we'll get into that and what's going on with the Sens and Leafs again three days into their camp with Mike Johnson in about 20 minutes. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on the TSN app. All right, Mike Johnson will join us in about 20 minutes. TSN's top 50 list will be revealed next week, and I'm looking forward to seeing, I guess, how it all plays out and who you know who lands where based on my list. I know the three of us all put in our list. O's put in his list. You know, a bunch of us at TSN do this, and I'm always curious to see, you know, how far off I am and who maybe I had on that the collective list doesn't have on, who I missed that the collective list does have on. But, Frankie, you and I did a, a Sports Center hit that's now up on tsn.ca. Uh, find it on YouTube as well. That uh, Alex Ovechkin is not in the top 50 oh, for the first time ever. It? Ovi really? did not make it. And I'm pumping my own tires here. Remember, Noodles, you'll remember this. Yeah. We got into it last year. I didn't have him in my top 50 last year. And you and O were like, you're an idiot. How could you Why? possibly think like that? How <laughs> well, dare you? Well, he had 40 you? goals the year before, right? Was I right? Or was yeah. he a top 50 player last year or what? No, no chance no, I, he was. No, but I mean, uh, I guess, you know what? When you drop off, like, the, keep in mind, he's, what is he, 39? 39 years old. Yeah. like Just turned 39. Yeah. I, I, he's I not a top 50 guy. He's, he's I give not Ovi a lot a of credit. I, I, I give him a lot of credit for what he did last year where it was a very slow start, and I think a lot of people were questioning, would he ever catch Gretzky? And the way he finished that season, he found some scoring touch, and he gets, is it 30, 32 goals? Like he, yeah. he, it was a very, very respectable number for him, and he found his, his touch. Ultimately, though, 
there's guys now that are number one centers, number one defensemen, number one goalies that put up a point per game, score 40 goals, you know, play a lot defensively. It's just like there's other guys moving up the list now. It's not an indictment wow. on Ovi per se. It's just crowded. There's a lot of really good young players that are doing a lot for, for their teams that deserve to be on that list. Keep in mind, if you just took away the name Ovechkin bes beside his stats – they're not stunning. A lot of people in the league have those stats. Yes. Right? Like 28, 32 goals, mm -hmm. like 70 points. Like, they're, you know, guys like that. He had less than that, I believe. What did he have yeah, last year? 31 goals. 60 something points. 31 goals, and I think 64, 65 points. Yeah, that, there's a lot of guys who are good players that yeah. get those stats that are not. Nazem Kadri had more, more. Stats right, and, and furthermore, I, he's not on the list. We'll kill penalties. We'll play a more prominent position. You know, like that—that's right. his reality. Is that he's he's a winger that isn't yeah. nearly as aggressive or physical as he once was, and he's probably going to score you thirty, probably give you sixty points, and that's a really yeah. good player. He's still yeah. a really good player, exactly. But there's definitely fifty guys that are ahead of him. I'd be curious if anyone had him on their top fifty. Like I'd well, be curious what the case would do. be. I think guys will guys guys will still have Ovi. I wonder with this list, like how much, how many legacy picks do guys have? Because I, I found with my list this year, I was leaning towards the youth movement. You know that we're seeing where it may be a guy like Quinton Byfield sneaks in, mm -hmm. or you know Wyatt Johnston's going to be on the list somewhere. Like there's yeah. there's some guys, Robert Thomas in St. Louis. There, there's guys that are like going to be big-time players this year that's that, are, yeah. that are making their way up the list. That's the way sports works. The younger guys are always going to get there at some point. Yeah, all of those guys you named were not on my list, but they probably will be a year from now. Like, right. the, if they're not, they, they, they should be and could be this year, but I, I, had, I didn't have some of them pushing out other players. Where I found a spot, you know, I found a spot for Nick Suzuki for me. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if he's on other guys' lists. I but have like, him, yeah. But, yeah, like, I have him. you know, that was the first time I Nick Suzuki was on my list. Somebody's got to come off, right? Like, that's that's what it is. You know, I, I, I did have Clayton Keller, I believe, on my list, which is, again, a 72-point guy. But in Arizona slash Utah, probably not the sexiest pick. But here's a guy who's really got some production coming into his own. But you're right. It's, it, it's not so much legacy. The other thing, too, is... I might be a little bit more goalie slash defenseman heavy than other people that just, you know, other guys who choose are looking more forward or winger or center and, and stats like goals and assists as opposed. I had a tough time choosing, you know, defensemen because some D men are really good, but they may not have the sexy stats, but they're a hell of a player, you know? Like sure. And, and that should be accounted for. I mean, we talked about that earlier in the week where O was yeah. saying he, he looks at it as a point production list and, I don't think that's the that's not how I approach it. Yet no. it's not it's natural to look towards that. And generally speaking, the best players are putting up the most points. Right. But there's still a lot of guys who are littered through this list for a long time that aren't there. Like o Ovi's the most recent guy to come out. I'll bet you Eric Carlson comes out this year. I think he I should. Didn't have, I didn't have that's him fair. on my list. Exactly. The only reason he got in, he got in last year naturally because he should have because the year before. At 100 points. But the year before, he wasn't in the top 50 because everyone had written him off. Like, yeah. Malkin's not on it anymore. Latang's not on it anymore. Giroux's not on it anymore. Brent yeah. Burns isn't there anymore. Like, there's a number of guys in the league for 10, 12 years, 50, close to 15. They were just blocks, yeah. and they're not a part of it anymore. Well, and, like, the one guy who, who holds on is Sid. And yeah. I'm I am very curious to see where he's going to land here. I I can pretty much guarantee it's in the top twenty. I'm curious if it's in the top fifteen. He was top twenty for me. I don't he was know top where twenty he was. for me as he's well. Top top fifteen for me. So yeah. like that's the lone guy of the kind of in the league for fifteen, sixteen years plus that I can think of. Unless I'm missing some. I guess Brad Marchand is another one that maybe he's around. I, th I think I put him in. I said that earlier in the week, but I have a feeling he won't be in the top 50. But, yeah, it's, yeah, you're it's right. tough. Like, guys that have been around that long, like, Sid seems like the guy who's hanging around, for sure. Like, yeah. the unanimous guy that's hanging around. I wonder when it comes to the D-man, 
you know, when people put their lists together, are they just looking at points or are they looking at other stuff? Because like I, I got Gus Forsling in my list. Mm-hmm. If, if you can shut down McDavid in the playoffs the way he did or tried to, and he did a pretty damn good job, if you ask me, uh, that's a top 50 player. And I, I think there's yeah. some point production to go with it. That's a good point. Forsling is that guy. You know, Slavin's been that guy forever in Carolina yeah. who doesn't put up numbers, but everyone – that watches yeah. him or tracks him says the same thing, the way he defends, the way he moves the puck, all that kind of stuff. And there's certainly a lot of value in that. Um, all right, Mike Johnson will join us on this. OV outside the top 50. Um, also get into the Leafs early in the camp with, with Johnny now that things are off and running and a number of other things going on throughout the NHL. And Bill Shaken will join us of the LA Times on the Shohei Otani phenomenon. That's coming up at 530. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 2.